My name is Joseph and today I'm going to do a paper on Zion the New Jerusalem, Righteous, Wicked. And so to begin this presentation I want to quote from President Russell M. Nelson in the October 2021 conference in his introductory address. He said, there has never been a time in the history of the world when knowledge of our Saviour is more personally vital and relevant to every human soul. Contrary to the doubts of some, there really is such a thing as right and wrong. There really is absolute truth, eternal truth. One of the plagues of our day is that too few people know where to turn for truth. <coughs> and uh, I can hear many members of the church smugly thinking, yeah, those poor people outside the church, they just uh, haven't got it right. Um, but we have the truth because this is the only true church. Um, and then there's others at the moment that are doubting and are not sure where we're at. However, I just want to pose a question. When you go to church, can you raise all the doctrines that you've studied? And will everyone agree with you? Have, do you ever get people at church raising doctrines? Uh, and then you listen and you go, well, that's not right. Um, at least that's not what I've studied or whatever the case may be. Unless I'm Robertson Caruso and the only one here, I've had that experience many, many times. And uh, I've even had study periods with people and, and shared what I understood the scriptures to me and um, get difference of opinions. I've, uh, over the years, I've had to change my opinions too because I've studied different, um, I guess you would call them scholars and even manuals and um, believed what they've said and then later on read scriptures and, and teachings of prophets and found them different to what I've learned earlier. So I'd like to read from 2 Nephi. So Nephi has seen the last days and remember uh, President Nelson recently said that we have front row seats to what Nephi only saw in vision. And then he referred to Nephi chapter 14 but if you go through uh, or 2 Nephi chapter 14, if you go through 2 Nephi um, he, can, he does talk a lot about the last days and in this particular chapter 26 verse 14 he says behold I prophesy unto you concerning the last days concerning the days when the Lord shall bring these things forth unto the children of men restoration of the gospel and what's happening and remember Joe, um, President Nelson said this is an ongoing restoration it hasn't been completed yet so reading a bit further Nephi shares and the Gentiles, and interesting enough, whether you believe it or not, we're Gentiles. We, as Gentiles, joined the church. We, through our patriarchal blessing, we got shown our lineage, and so that we consider ourselves of the house of Israel. Um, but the gospel was brought to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are joining the church. And um, as Israel has been scattered throughout the world, we are gathering Israel. Um, but we were Gentiles brought into the church. And so just think about that and now read this scripture. And the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of their stumbling block, that they have built up many churches. Nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God. And yes, that is true. You can look back into the, the earlier times when Joseph Smith restored the church um, the churches didn't believe in miracles and it was was there was many different churches etc etc but let's just bring this back into our day right here and now because the scriptures the book of mormon are for us as we head into um the second coming of christ which is very close president nelson has, has explained that really well so we're bringing the book of those scriptures mean something they weren't just for the people in joseph smith time they're for the people in our time so if we're the gentiles and that we have pride and we've built up many churches and I'd like to equate that to how many doctrines are there you go onto YouTube and listen to all these come follow me people and they're not all teaching the same thing they're not all teaching exactly the same thing there might be groups of them teaching but there's lots of different voices out there 
Um, so many churches are built up. So a lot of them are playing down the miracles and changing down, and playing down Joseph Smith. And, um, you know, he wasn't as great a prophet as we say he is. And there's all this stuff going on at the moment and that he was into um, witchcraft and all this sort of stuff. And there's lots of stuff going out there. So just going back to the scripture, nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God and preach up unto themselves their own wisdom, their own learning, that they may get gain and grind upon the face of the poor. How many people are charging for what they're teaching or putting advertising on their YouTube to get money or get subscriptions? And um, yeah, anyway, continue on. And there are many churches built up which cause envyings and strifes and malice. Have you heard any of envyings and strifes and malice within the church? There seems to be people bartering this way and that way, talking about what's going on. And there are also secret combinations, even as in times of old, according to the combinations of the devil. For he is the founder of all these things. Yea, the founder of murder and works of darkness, yea, and he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord, until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. For behold, my beloved brethren, I say unto you that the Lord God worketh not in darkness. And of course, if there's combination, secret combinations in the church right here today and now, would we see it? Of course not. It's in darkness. They do it behind them. They're smooth. They're... However, if you haven't already, if you don't know about the Salamander letters and um, uh, Arrington and his, his um, uh, diaries that have come out now and he talked about when he was um, uh, the church historian back in the, the um, 70s and 80s and what happened there and, and what happened with, with there's lots of stuff going on. There's combinations going on in the church. There's toing and froing. Um, anyway, so we've got to be careful of all that. that. That is out there. It's real. Continuing on from Nephi. And he commandeth that there shall be no priestcrafts. For behold, priestcrafts, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world. But they seek not the welfare of Zion. Behold, the Lord hath forbidden this thing. And think to yourself, especially those of you who are more close to Utah and what's going on in Utah, can you think of any men and women who um, preach and set themselves up for a light and unto the world and look at me, I'm an expert in this area and I'm an expert about this history, women, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, whatever, and sell books and get paraphernalia and, and they have clubs and talk about each other and say this man's good and that man's good. Well, it sounds a bit like priestcraft to me, but I certainly see that around a lot. So we need to, Nephi's warning us, be careful of these things. They're out there. But President Nelson is telling us there is absolute truth. There is right and wrong. And too few people know where to turn for truth. Now, he's teaching the members of the church here. So is he just talking about outside the church? I think not. And just let your mind travel with me for a while on this and see how you feel. Let's go to Joseph F. Smith. In 1906, in the Juvenile Instructor, he, he said this. Among the Latter-day Saints, the preaching of false doctrines disguised as truths of the gospel may be expected from two classes and practically from these only. They are, first, the hopelessly ignorant, whose lack of intelligence is due to their indolence and sloth, who make but feeble effort, if needed any at all, to better themselves by reading and study. Those who are afflicted with a dread disease that may develop into an incurable malady, laziness. Go to YouTube, see how many people are putting out presentations and look at their resources. Find out where they're getting their information from or plagiarizing it from. But anyway, 
I mean, and I don't, by plagiarising, I don't mean quoting scripture. I mean using other people's stuff. But anyway, just have a look yourself. You can see. The second group that Joseph F. Smith talks about is the proud and self-vaunting ones who read by the lamp of their own conceit, who interpret by rules of their own contriving, who have become a law unto themselves, and so pose as the sole judges of their own doings, more dangerously ignorant than the first. Hmm. Sounds to me like Joseph F. Smith is trying to warn us of priestcraft. That's just my interpretation. Take it as you read what the president of the church was telling us at that time. Let's bring it a little bit closer. Ezra Taft Benson in 1969, and there's a plethora of uh, quotes that we could have from Ezra Taft Benson, but this one I think suffices for what we're talking about today. Um, it was a talk to the humble followers of Christ in 1969 April General Conference. Sometimes we hear someone refer to a division in the church. In reality, the church is not divided. It simply means that there are some who, for the time being at least, are members of the church but not in harmony with it. These people have a temporary membership and influence in the church, but unless they repent, they will be missing when the final membership records are recorded. It is well that our people understand this principle, so they will not be misled by those apostates within the church who have not yet repented or been cut off. But there is a cleansing coming the Lord says that his vengeance will be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among you, saith the Lord, who professed to know my name and have not known me. I look forward to that cleansing. Its need within the church is becoming increasingly apparent. This was in 1969. Anyway, I'll let you be the judge. So pure truth and pure doctrine of Christ. That's enough said of that previous subject. Doctrine and Covenants 123. It is, imperative, it is an imperative duty that we owe to all the rising generation and to all the pure in heart. For there are many yet on the earth among all sex parties and denominations. I think the Church of Jesus Christ is part of that, who are blinded by the subtle craftiness of men, whereby they lay in wait, lie in wait to deceive, and who are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. Again, President Nelson says, there is real, really an absolute truth, an eternal truth, one of the plagues of our days is that too few people know where to turn for truth. The other thing I think is interesting is uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians. He said, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So there should be one doctrine. We should all be believing one doctrine. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not seeing that at the moment. Nephi, um, when explaining about the, his father's dream, his brethren said unto him, and they said unto me, What meaneth the rod of iron which our father saw that led to the tree? And I said unto them that it was the word of God, and whoso would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish, neither could the temptations of the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness, to lead them away to destruction. Here is where we will find, where we will find truth. The truth comes through the word of God. And how is the word of God? How do we get the word of God? Well, we have prophets. We have the prophet of the restoration, Joseph Smith. 
he's the head of this dispensation and all prophets following him um, lean unto him. And so if we learn the words of the prophet Joseph Smith, that will help us to find truth. If we study the scriptures, that will help us find truth. Specifically study the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price, the, the scriptures written by the prophet of our dispensation for our day. And the Book of Mormon was written specifically by the prophets of old for our day. They saw our day. We need to study and learn from these scriptures. The Doctrine and Covenants was a template for us. It's to help us navigate these last days. And then listen to the current prophet um, as we go through. And so this is where we'll get truth. So with that establishment, just be careful as you go on this topic and any other topic. Are we looking for one truth? And where will we find that truth? In the Word of God. And not only that, if we if we hearken unto the Word of God and hold fast unto it, then we would never perish. But if we let go of the Scriptures, if we rest the Scriptures, if we wrestle with the Scriptures and say, oh, no, I don't believe that's true. Oh, no, that didn't mean that. The Scriptures don't actually mean it that way. And then we start postulating and negotiating and bumping chests with these um, intellectuals and doing all sorts of stuff. Off with the fairies. Anyway, let's continue on. Zion. Let's t discuss this, this, the uh, Zion, New Jerusalem. There's many different theories out there as to what Zion, the New Jerusalem, is going to be like. Let's see what the scriptures say. First of all, I've got, I've got several quotes. Doctrine and Covenants 45, 65 to 71. And with one heart and with one mind, gather up your riches that ye may purchase an inheritance which shall hereafter be appointed unto you. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a, land, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. Hmm. So Zion is going to be a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. I'll just pin that for a second. Continuing. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord also shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it and it shall be called Zion. So the wicked are not going to come to Zion. Pin that. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered into it out of every nation under heaven. And it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. And that's usually where we end when we get this quote. So, yeah, 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 it's for the saints, but anyone who doesn't want to fight is going to come to Zion. Mm, okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about how Zion's set up, but here at the moment, this is instructions. The Doctrine and Covenants is actually instruction on how to set up the city of Zion. And, and whilst it, it didn't work because of the unfaithfulness of the saints at that particular time, um, which is clearly stated in the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith was setting it up and he gave us instructions. And so this is in our, our instruction book, and it says, with one heart and one mind. One heart and one mind is believing the same things, understanding the same things. At the church, we're not even at that point yet, let alone people outside the church. Um, but also, it's very clearly that Zion will be for the safety of the saints, um, of the Most High God. Okay, well, how is just any random person who doesn't want to fight going to come to Zion? Well, hang on a minute. Let's read a bit further in Doctrine of Covenants. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations and shall come to Zion, singing with songs of everlasting joy. Oh, that's who we're gathering out from all nations. It's the righteous. We'll discuss a bit further out what the righteous are. Um, so here we are, a people of one heart and one mind, and they're righteous. Let's continue on just studying the scriptures. So we've pinned those couple of things that we need. So it's not just anyone who doesn't want to battle that's going to come to Zion. It's going to be the righteous. We're going to go out and get them. 
uh, those people who are in Zion will go out and, and call them in. And that's another whole topic. Continue on Doctrine and Covenants 100 verses 13 and 16. And now I give unto you a word concerning Zion. Zion shall be redeemed, although she is chastened for a little season. Now this is, they tried to set up Zion, it failed, long story, but anyway, it failed. The, the, then the persecution came and they were kicked out. Now remember, the reason it was not it was not successful is because there were not enough members who were righteous. And because they were not righteous, following their prophet, the wicked were allowed to persecute them. This is a theme that happens over and over again. Go into the Old Testament. The, the, the children of Israel, every time they went wicked, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, they come and took them in and put them in, you know, uh, in bondage. Then they'd be righteous and then they'd go out and be free again. Then they'd go into bondage. If you go through the Book of Mormon, it's the same cycle over and over and over again. As Latter-day Saints, we're, we're still dealing with this. We were righteous people. We did well, but we weren't righteous enough. And so therefore, Zion was redeemed. So Heavenly Father's comforting the saints at that time. It says, and now, because there were so many, there were many righteous people that were not enough, though. There were not enough to redeem Zion. And now I give unto you a word of concerning Zion. Zion shall be redeemed. So he's given them hope. Although she is chastened for a little season. And then he tells them, For I will raise up unto myself a pure people that will serve me in righteousness. Boom, pin that. To the other righteousness. It seems like a pure people who will serve him, serve him in righteousness. How do you serve God? You obey his commandments and you follow his prophets. Okay, let's keep the reading and get more about um, Zion, New Jerusalem. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 16 to 20. Therefore, let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion, for all flesh is in my hands. I mean, they've been persecuted, kicked out, all sorts of problems. They had a really tough time, but Heavenly Father just, he still encourages them along and, and helps them along. Um, for all flesh is in my hands. Be still and know that I am God. Zion shall not be moved out of her place, notwithstanding her children are scattered. So Zion is still going to be in Jackson County, Missouri. They that remain and are pure in heart shall return. So the, the pure in heart will return and come to their inheritances. They and their children with songs of everlasting joy to build up the waste places of Zion. And all these things that the prophets might be fulfilled. And behold, there is none other place appointed than that which I have appointed. Neither shall there be any other place appointed than that which I have appointed for the work of the gathering of my saints. So again, the saints are going to Zion. It's going to be the pure in heart. They're going to go singing um, everlasting joy. Okay, continuing on, uh, 97. Inasmuch as my people build a house unto me in the name of the Lord and do not suffer any unclean thing to come into it, that it be not defiled, my glory shall rest upon it, yea, and my presence shall be there, for I will come unto it. And all the pure in heart that shall come into it shall see God. But if it be defiled, I will not come into it, and my glory shall not be there for I will not come into unholy temples. So he's explaining about temples there. Okay, so the Saviour will come to his temple, any temple, as long as the righteous, the pure, only go into there. You can't bring in the others. But he continues and says, and, and I'm reading directly on, 15 to 21, so it's not like it's, I'm jumping to scriptures from here and there. And now behold, if Zion do these things, she shall prosper and spread herself and become a very glorious, very great and very terrible. And the nations of the earth shall honour her and shall say, surely Zion is the city of our God and surely Zion cannot fall, neither be moved out of her place. For God is there and the hand of the Lord is there and he hath sworn by the power of his might to be her salvation and her tower. Therefore, verily, thus saith the Lord, let Zion rejoice. For this is Zion, the pure in heart, 
Therefore, let Zion rejoice while all the wicked mourn, shall mourn. So, to me, that's very clear. What's opposite to wicked? It's the pure in heart. So the righteous, the pure in heart, synonymous. Um, and opposite to righteous are wicked. Opposite to pure in heart are wicked. Who are going to come to the city of Zion? The righteous, the pure in heart. Um, not the wicked. The wicked aren't going to come. They might not want to fight each other, but they're not going to get into Zion. And we'll continue on. How many more scriptures can tell us this? And whatsoever city thy servants shall enter. So here he's Doctrine and Covenants 109. The Lord's talking about sending people out uh, to gather. And the people of that city receive their testimony. Let thy peace and thy salvation be upon that city, that they may gather out of that city the righteous, that they may come forth to Zion or to her stakes, the places of thine appointment with songs of everlasting joy. So again, it's the righteous that we're gathering, not just someone who doesn't want to fight. Continuing on, Doctrine and Covenants 109, 54 to 58 this time. Have mercy, O Lord, upon all the nations of the earth. Have mercy upon the rulers of our land. May those principles which were so honorably and nobly defended, namely the constitution of our land by our fathers, be established forever. Remember the kings, the princes, the nobles, and the great ones of the earth, and all the people, and the churches, all the poor, the needy, and afflicted ones of the earth, that their hearts may be softened when thy servants shall go out from thy house, O Jehovah, to bear testimony of thy name, that their prejudices may give way before the truth and thy people may obtain favour in the sight of all, that all the ends of the earth may know that we, thy servants, have heard thy voice, and that thou hast sent us, that from among all these, thy servants, the sons of Jacob, may gather out the righteous. Who are they gathering? The righteous to build a holy city to thy name as thou hast commanded them. It's not any Tom, Dick or Harry. We're, we're only going to bring the righteous to Zion. Let's continue on. Doctrine and Covenants 38, 3 to 6. I am the same which spake, and the world was made, and all things came by me. I am the same which have taken the Zion of Enoch into mine own bosom. And verily I say, even as many as have believed in my name, for I am Christ, and in my own name, by the virtue of the blood which I have spilt, have I pleaded before the Father for them. But behold, the residue of the wicked have I kept in chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day, which shall come at the end of the earth. And even so will I cause the wicked to be kept. For they will not hear my voice, but harden their hearts, and woe, woe, woe is their doom. Another example, uh, Zion of Enoch are the righteous, the pure in heart, one heart, one mind. And Christ dwelt with them, and Christ took them up to him. But the wicked, who were all at war and all doing all sorts of stuff outside of, of um Zion, um, they are kept in chains, and woe, woe, woe unto them. So there's a very clear definition between righteous and wicked. Doctrine and Covenants 59, 1-5. Behold, blessed saith the Lord, are they who have come up unto this land with an eye single to my glory, according to my commandments, not any other commandments of any other church, not... Um, nice people who do nice things. These are people who if they're eye single to my glory being the Lord, according to my commandments being for those that live shall inherit the earth and those that die shall rest from all their labours and their works shall follow them and they shall receive a crown in the mansions of my father which I have prepared for them. 
Yea, blessed are they whose feet stand upon the land of Zion, who have obeyed my gospel, for they shall receive their reward and good things of the earth, and it shall bring forth in its strength, and they shall also be crowned with blessings from above, yea, and with commandments not a few, and with revelations in their time, that they are faithful and diligent before me. Wherefore I give unto them a commandment, saying thus, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy might, mind and strength. And in the name of Jesus Christ thou shalt serve him. These are the people that are in Zion. I, I'm not going to go into the other side discussion. We'll just focus on what we know. This, this is what's happening in Zion. Doctrine and covenants. And when I talk about Zion, I'm talking about the new Jerusalem that will be redeemed, where the temple will be built and where Jesus will come. I'm not talking about the Zion in our hearts. We need to develop the Zion in our hearts to be a people that can go there because it's only the righteous that will go there. Wherefore, Doctrine and Covenants 63, and, and yet you go through the scriptures, see if you can find anywhere where it tells you in the scriptures that the, those who are not obeying God will go to Zion. I haven't read that so far, and I've got a few more to go, and I still, and I searched the scriptures. I couldn't find anywhere where it says the unrighteous or the wicked will go to Zion because they don't want to fight, so they're going to go to Zion. Yeah, they might not want to fight, but the only reason they go to Zion is if they're righteous. You can't get into Zion unless you're righteous. Wherefore, seeing that I, the Lord, sorry, Doctrine and Covenants 63, wherefore, seeing that I, the Lord, have decreed all, thing, all these things upon the face of the earth, I will that my saints should be assembled upon the land of Zion. Who's going to be assembled there? My saints. And that every man should take righteousness in his hands and faithfulness upon his loins and lift up a warning voice unto the inhabitants of the earth and declare both by word and by flight that desolation shall come upon the wicked. So if you don't want to be there in the desolation amongst the wicked, repent, be baptized and become righteous. And continuing on, Doctrine and Covenants 76, 50 to 70. I'll just read it. And again, we bear record, for we saw and heard. And this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. They are they who received their testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name and according to the commandment which he has given, that by keeping the commandments, they might be washed and cleansed from all sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed up unto that power, and who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. They are they who are the church of the firstborn. They are they who into whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings, who have received of, the, of his fullness and of his glory. Think of the temple as you're looking at that. Continuing. And are priests of the Most High, after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch, which was after the order of the only begotten Son. Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of gods, Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present or things to come. All are theirs, and they are Christ, and Christ is God's, and they shall overcome all things. Wherefore, let no man glory in man, but rather let him glory in God, who shall subdue all enemies under his feet. These shall dwell in the presence of God and his Christ for ever and ever. These are they who he shall bring with him when he shall come in cl the clouds of heaven to reign on the earth over his people, the city of Enoch. They're going to come with him. These are they who, sh who shall have part in the first resurrection. These are they who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just, which will happen at this great dreadful day. Notice also, 
These are they who are come unto Mount Zion. Mount Zion is another word for the New Jerusalem. So these are they who come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of holies. The reason the New Jerusalem is being built, the reason that Zion is being created and people are gathering there is to prepare for the second coming of the Saviour and to have a people prepared to meet the Saviour when he comes with all those in clouds of great glory and they will be lifted up to meet him. So how, how can they just be the average Joe Blow in, in the world who doesn't want to fight? How can they be not members of the church? Uh, think about this. What we've read, these are they, and these are they who come onto Mount Zion. The scriptures are loud and clear. If we don't foggy them with the intellectualization of man, just read the scriptures as they are. I haven't read anything else except scriptures and, and uh, general conference talks. And I'm yet to find these other theories that I keep hearing outside and, and was taught me over the years. Um, anyway, I'll continue on. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of Enoch and of the firstborn. These are they whose names are written in heaven, where God and Christ are the judge of all. These are they who are just men made perfect through Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out this perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. These are they whose bodies are celestial, and whose glory is that of the Son, even the glory of God, the highest of all, whose glory, the Son of the firmament, is written as, as of as being typical. So I think through all these scriptures, and, and again, I plead with you to go and search the scriptures, grab hold of the iron rod, um, seek out what you can find about the new Jerusalem and Zion and what people go there. But as I said, in all my searching, I couldn't find anywhere where it says nice people who don't want to obey, the, that don't want to be baptised and don't want to become members of the church can come into Zion. Everything that it says about here is righteous, pure in heart, and pure in heart are not people, when you study pure in heart, it's not a nice person. A pure in heart are those who obey God. So anyway, let's, let's, let's continue on with Scripture. Uh, not, I'll try not to... I, uh, Anyway, I just want to continue on with scripture. How do you become righteous? Let's talk Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him, then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Okay, so now we're going to understand what the, it's the difference between the righteous and the wicked. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So I'm understanding here that the righteous are those that serve God and the wicked are those that don't serve God. So a man or a woman who lives a good life, as the world calls it, who um, as a young man or woman through school is nice, is a captain of, or you know, head of a school, everyone loves them, they're nice people, they they to live the world, but they're nice people, they get go to university, get good jobs, get married maybe, later on in life, whatever, but they get married, have a couple of kids, um, they, they never rob a bank, they never do any bad things, they're just good people, um, never go to church, but you know, give, give to charity, work on the PNC committee, do really nice things, and really... And you go over to their place, they're friendly and nice here, have a beer, here, it's a good, you know, they're all nice people, um, and they live their whole life and then they die. Or, better still, they live their whole life and bang, the second coming events start to happen. And anyone who's not going to stop fight against their neighbour is going to go to the Lord. These people know not God, they've never served him, and they don't want to serve him. They don't want to change. 
Are they going to Zion? Are they righteous? Malachi here very clearly says, how do you discern between the righteous and the wicked? Between him that serveth God, righteous, and him that serveth not God. Let's continue on and see if Scripture says anything more about this. Mosiah chapter 2, verse 17. And behold, I tell you these things, that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow being, ye are a service of your God. All right, so it sounds like you don't have to go to church. You can just serve your fellow being, then you're serving God. Let's continue on. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then in John, the Saviour says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. So that John and Mary Doe that I just explained about, who are nice people, but don't want to go to church, don't want to serve God, don't want to hear the missionaries, don't want to do anything like that. And there's many of them around. Um, do they love God? No. So they're not really, and they're not serving God, because if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. Let's talk about what his commandments are too. And uh, in this day and age, this is some of these are quite obscure. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Oh, okay, so you can't go and uh, spend your life in, in your fast cars and boats and go to sports and holidays and not worry about church and don't serve God. So if I do all that and I don't go to church and I don't listen to the missionaries and I don't get baptised and I don't serve God, am I breaking a commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He is the first God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. But if we worship the things that we create with our hands, our, our cars, our boats, our houses, our cell phones, our big TV screens, our etc., etc., are we breaking that second commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Oh my goodness, my ears hurt with pain as I go out into the world. And listen to the name of the Lord taken in vain. I strive and I ask and I plead with people to not speak like that. Um, but it, it's, it's just a bombardment. Are those people serving God? Are they righteous? The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of thy, the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And of course, in the world, there's plenty of good people. Do they keep the Sabbath day holy? Do we keep the Sabbath day holy? And, and so I'm not, I'm, as I go through this too, I'm asking us all to look at ourselves as well as being aware. And, and it's important that, that um, I, I didn't get the scripture in here, but if you go to the scripture in Matthew where it says, judge not that ye be not judged, just take it into the Joseph Smith translation. And it makes very clearly that you should judge not unrighteously but judge righteously. You need to judge righteously. Go and read Moroni and learn about judging and how you can judge. It is important. If you cannot discern between truth and error, how will you know the difference? If you cannot discern the righteous from the wicked, how will you know the difference? How will you know who to emulate, who to become like? And so these scriptures, you can see what's happening in the world. 
Are you going to emulate the world or not? Are you going to become like God or not? If you want to go to Zion, we need to be righteous. Okay, and then honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not commit kill. Thou shalt, and, and anyway, I'm not going to go into each of these, but you can go into them yourselves and look at the world and where it is. But thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Right next to adultery. So it's a pretty important thing. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. No lying. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. Um, so we're starting to get an idea of what the righteous need to be like. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Day Saints, we believe in the Articles of Faith. And so let's read through those. So we believe in God the Eternal Father and in his Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Ghost. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. We'll cover that a bit more later. We believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second repentance, third baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Article of A5, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and administer the ordinances thereof. Six, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. Seven, we believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. Eight, we, sorry, just before I carry on. So again, do we believe in, in prophecy and in revelation and visions and healings, interpretation of tongues and tongues? And do we believe in apostles, prophets? As members of the church, do we really believe that? Do all the members of the church believe that? Are we all one with that? Do we follow them? Do we live by them? And look, if we want all those who want to get to Zion, do we do that? Uh, the eighth one, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it, it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. So do we read it? Do we study it? Do we learn it? Do we understand it? Do we apply it? Um, nine, we believe all that God has revealed, we all, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There, President Nelson's priming us. Um, some of the greatest miracles that will, will happen, uh, we'll see that how the uh, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are at the head of this church, and we'll see marvellous miracles happen in this church. Um, there are many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God that will yet be revealed. Will we accept them? Will we believe them when they are revealed? Ten, we believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. So we believe in the two things. President Nelson is teaching us and helping us in the literal gathering of Israel, and that is happening now on both sides of the veil. The restoration of the ten tribes is not going to happen just yet, but it will happen. We do believe it is happening. It's a separate thing. We also believe that Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent and that Christ will reign personally upon the earth and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. These events will happen and that's sequentially as they will happen. Um, 11. We claim the privilege of worshipping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men that same privilege. Let them worship how, where or what they may. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers and magistrates in obeying, honouring and sustaining the law. And 13, we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous and in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things, we hope all things, we have endured many things and we hope to be able to endure all things. If there is anything virtuous, lovely or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. Um, so we're building what is the type of person that's going to get to Zion? This is the type of person that's going to get to Zion, who believes all these things. Do we, and as we look at ourselves preparing to go to Zion, do we believe all these things? <clears throat> Let's see what Joseph Smith said. 
Um, the question is frequently asked, can we not be saved without going through all these ordinances? I would answer no, not the fullness of salvation. Jesus said, there are many mansions in my Father's house, and I will go and prepare a place for you. Any person who is exalted to the highest mansion has to abide a celestial law and the whole law too. Okay, so we have to participate in ordinances and we've got to abide celestial law. So this is all being a righteous person. True to the faith. Page 109 says, In the church, an ordinance is a sacred, formal act performed by the authority of the priesthood. Some ordinances are essential to our exaltation. These ordinances are called saving ordinances. They include baptism, confirmation, ordination to the Melchizedek priesthood for men, the temple endowment and marriage sealing, which with each of these ordinances, we enter into solemn covenants with the Lord. Elder Bednar explained about those covenants. Across the generations from the prophet Joseph Smith to President Russell M. Nelson, the doctrinal purposes of temple ordinances and covenants have been taught extensively by church leaders. A rich reservoir of resources exists in print, audio, video and other formats to help us learn about initiatory ordinances, endowments, marriages and other sealing ordinances. Information also is available about following the Saviour by receiving and honouring covenants to keep the law of obedience, the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, the law of chastity and the law of consecration. So a righteous person needs to participate in the ordinances of baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, ordination to the priesthood for men, temple endowments and celestial marriage. They must covenant to live the law of obedience, the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, the law of chastity and the law of consecration. If you're wanting to be in Zion, if you're wanting to flee from whatever else is happening in the world, you need to be righteous. You need to participate in these ordinances. You need to participate in these laws. And you need to know and understand them. So study them and learn them. So now we're pretty well establishing, I think, that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we can go to Zion when, it, when it's built. We can go there. Um, and those who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you're welcome to come. You just need to accept your Heavenly Father, accept your Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, accept baptism and the other ordinances and laws, and anyone who wants to do that can come to Zion, and all will be welcome who follow the Lord and obey his commandments. Obey the Ten Commandments um, and, uh, and accept uh, the, pro the living prophets. Okay, so let's th stop there for a second and move on to Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. And then at that day, this is the Saviour speaking, before the Son of Man comes, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Least there not be enough for us, and you go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came all those virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, Ye know me not. And the Saviour says, Watch ye therefore, for ye no, neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now, there's many interpretations that can be done by this, but basically every interpretation that I'm aware of are saying that the ten virgins are active members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not only active members of the Church of Jesus Christ, but they are um, 
part of the bridal party. They're ready, waiting. So they they've got the the robes on. They've got the lamps. They've got the oil. So they're I would say active members of the Church of Jesus Christ. They're going to the temple, fully worthy, um, going to the temple. And so these are good members of the church. And yet five of them are not going to be um, not going to to go into the Savior. Wouldn't you say? that the five who go in are righteous and the five who don't are wicked. And I feel that this is a roadblock for most of us in our heads. We just don't want to see wicked as wicked. We want to see wicked as the what we did you know, when we grew up on the, on the cartoons with the, the, the big moustache or the angry man and, and he's ugly and he's terrible and that. The real life is not like that. I don't know how many of you have had your experiences, but in my experiences in life, some of the nicest people I've known have been wicked to the point of um, they would crucify you. <laughs> I don't care. As long as they get gained, they will. And I've watched them do it to me and to others um, and take them down, steal my money, wreck my businesses, um, Take other people's stuff, be unfaithful, except, and they're such nice people. You talk to them, and they're such nice. They give to charity. They do things. They do that. Uh, um, so you, they're wicked. The ones who look bad and and you know physically going hurt. The ones who look nice and do bad things are wicked as well. But what we've learned through these scriptures uh, that we've gone through, the wicked are those who do not serve God. Okay, so let's try and find out why these five unrighteous virgins are not righteous. Doctrine and Covenants section 1 verses 11 to 16. Wherefore the voice of the Lord is unto the ends of the earth, that all that will hear may hear. Prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come, for the Lord is nigh. And the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. And the arm of the Lord shall be revealed, and the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. Pause. How many of you, like me, have read this over and over again and going, yeah, those people outside the church, they just won't listen to the prophets. And yet, over the last couple of years, either do you know personally or at least you know someone who knows someone who has gone, I'm not following the prophet anymore, I'm out of here, and goes. And those people, when you think about it, have been not following the prophet for a long time. So who are the wicked? We're not following what the scriptures say. We're not following the prophet. They're wicked also. Yes, the wicked is a huge range. It comes from the guy with the, walking around the streets with the machete, just killing people left, right and centre, uh, stealing and robbing and hurting and maiming and so forth. They're wicked. But so are those who do not obey God. They're wicked also. And so this scripture is not just talking about non-members. It's talking about the members of the church. We, yes, we, we might go to, to conferences, put our hands up to sustain the prophets. But do we really listen to them? Do we follow them? And listen to this. It goes even further. And the Lord says, um, Neither give heed to the words of the prophets of apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. For they have strayed from mine ordinances. Now think back into members of the church now who are wicked and have broken mine everlasting covenant. So they've had the ordinances, but they're straying from them. And they have had the everlasting covenant, but they're breaking it. Are we breaking it? Look at it. Let's look at ourselves. If we want to prepare for Zion, we need to really introspectively look. Don't keep thinking at someone else. So have we, have we strayed from the ordinances? Have we broken the everlasting covenant? They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness. 
Mm, yeah, I, I got better things to do. Come back later, Lord. I'll do that later. Yeah, I'll study that later. I'll do that later. I'll serve later. But every man walketh in his own way and after, his, after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, whose substance is that of an idol, and waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. This scripture is so powerful and so meaningful and just really helped me to go, whoa, I've got to weed out. And uh, what is it this prophet said? Get out the deb debris from my life. These are the wicked. And we're talking members of the church here. And the Savior, he just, all through the scriptures, he's telling us all these things. And the whole world lieth in sin. And groaneth in, under darkness, and this is Doctrine and Covenants 84, 49 to 57. Uh, groaneth under darkness and under bondage of sin. And by this you may know they are under the bondage of sin, because they come not unto me. For whoso cometh not unto me is under bondage of sin. So are these just people not coming into the church? No, it's members of the church as well not coming unto the Saviour. And how will we not come unto the Saviour? He continues, And whoso receiveth not my voice is not acquainted with my voice and is not of me. And by this ye may know the righteous from the wicked. Whoa, he's telling us very clear. So it's not only those who don't serve God. Well, I guess this is the same. They're not serving God. But they're under the bondage of sin because they come not of here. We don't, we don't know his voice. And we're not acquainted with his voice. Let's continue reading. This gets even more. He's so clear. And that the whole world groaneth under sin and darkness even now. And your minds in time. So now he's talking like we're part of the world. So if we're, if we're going to align with these, well, then that's us. But then he gets specific to members of the church. And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you have treated lightly the things you have received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion. So these are the children of Zion, those who are preparing to go to Zion, even all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. Um, uh, I was around when President Benson was a prophet, and I remember hearing this, and I didn't understand. I did not understand. I didn't understand the scriptures. Now I do, but listen what President Benson, he said it over and over again, but this one clear in the end of Vessel from the April 86 General Conference. Unless we read the Book of Mormon and give heed to its teachings, the Lord has stated in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants that the whole church is under condemnation. So here in 1986, from 18, uh, whenever that was, 18 something, um, the church is still under condemnation. Now we not only need to say more about the Book of Mormon, but we need to do more with it. Why? The Lord answers in Doctrine and Covenants 84, 58 that they may bring forth fruit, meat for the Father's kingdom. Otherwise there remaineth a scourge and the judgment to be poured out upon the children of Zion. Through the Book of Mormon, we're able to, and, and just what I read earlier on, it's, uh, Nephi is telling us about pre, beware of priestcraft in the last days. It's a blueprint for the last days. We need to understand the Book of Mormon and apply it in our lives. We want to be the righteous. And, and there's all these warnings. And so, um, and, and how will we know when we're out, out of this condemnation? Because no prophet since President Benson has said we're out of this condemnation yet, yet. We will know when we receive the sealed portion of the gold plates. And that's another whole paper to go through all the reasons for that. But you search the scriptures, you'll find that to be true. Doctrine and Covenants 59, 21 to 23. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. Behold, this is according to the law and the prophets. Learn that he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. So the wicked 
are those who do not obey God, do not, um, they, they, those who offend God. And there were lots more scriptures that we could have gone. But it's very clear that it's the righteous who go to Zion. As we go out and we pull people from the nations into Zion, they will have to become righteous to get into Zion. Because in Zion there is only righteous. Okay. Um, to just a little bit more to go, but um, I, I wanted to hone in a little bit more on the difference between the wicked and the righteous. Because let's think about it, and let's be honest about this for a minute. And, and I'm not talking about the really, really wicked now. I'm talking about the wicked who, the ten virgins, they're good people. They're, they're good people. The five who don't make it are good people. They do lots of good things. What is the difference between the five virgins who go and the five virgins who don't? And there, I'm sure there's many others, but I'm going to use this as an example. Um so let's first of all look at what is wicked, what is truly wicked. And there's many, many, and it doesn't matter, in fact, any level of wicked, where you, where you go from just wicked, which I would call the five foolish virgins as just wicked. They've done many, many, many good things. I, I think you'll find, because it's going to happen. It is going to happen, there's no doubt. I'm hoping that I'm not on that side. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing all I can not to be, and I'm... I'm Anyway, I'm encouraging all those to do that as well. But those who are on that side, um, I bet you they have paid tithing for years on end. They have served faithfully in callings. They have um, reached out to the poor. They have given out. They've, there's lots of things that they will have done. So what makes them wicked? And are comparable to the other wicked all the way down to the line, how far you want to go to Satan. Let's read some scriptures to tell us. The answer. I won't hypothesize. I just go straight to the scriptures. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 25 to 26. And this we saw also and bear record that an angel of God who was in authority in the presence of God, who rebelled against the only begotten Son, whom the Father loved and who was in the bosom of the Father, was thrust down, to, thrust down from the presence of God and the Son and was called perdition. For the heavens wept over him. He was Lucifer, a son of the morning. What was his sin? He rebelled. So Lucifer rebelled against God. Let's learn a bit more about Lucifer. Where, Moses, chapter 4, verse 3 or 4. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, and I, the Lord God, or which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten. I caused that he should be cast down, and he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. Okay. Satan is the epitome of wickedness. What did he do? Because Satan rebelled against me. That was if he rebelled and then did all these other things. He rebelled and then he did this. And what is the rebelling? He sought to destroy the agency of man. And he went against what God said. He didn't listen to God's voice. And then what's he trying to do here on earth? even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. He will lead them captive. So let's continue on a bit more. Mosiah chapter 15, 26 to 27. But behold and fear and tremble before God, for ye ought to tremble, for the Lord redeemeth none such that rebel against him. Here it is again. So the... Um, uh, the I can't remember if it's Messiah or Benjamin, but anyway, it's, it, it's given the talk to the men who were causing such problems. And he said, um, none such that rebel, rebel against him and die in their sins. So if you rebel in this life and die in your sins, yea, even all those that have perished in their sins ever since the world began. So anyone who rebels and dies in their sins that have willfully rebelled against God, that have known the commandments of God and would not keep them. 
These are they that have no part in the first resurrection. They Therefore ought ye not to tremble, for salvation cometh to none such. For the Lord hath redeemed none such. Yea, neither can the Lord redeem such. For he cannot deny himself, for he cannot deny justice when it has his claim. And it's all throughout the scriptures. And again, I've just pulled out a few. You go ahead, if you want to get more and more, you, you'll see. But you'll, you'll start to see this. This is what Satan wants. He doesn't really care too much whether you're the five unwise virgins or all the way down to the most wicked person you can think of, Cain. All the way. He just wants any of it. He'll obviously get you further and further away. But if he can get that in, and what does he want you to do? He wants you to rebel. Listen to Samuel. And Samuel said, Hath the, it's speaking to Saul, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity. And idolatry. We're breaking the Ten Commandments here. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared people and obeyed their voice. So whose voice do we need to obey? We need to obey God's voice. Otherwise we rebel. Whatever the reason is, we're not obeying God's voice. If we fear the masses, if we fear whoever, brother, mother, sister, father, do we obey God or do we obey anyone else? If we obey anyone else, it's rebellion. Um, okay, Alma talks about it too. And now behold, I say unto you that if this people who have received so many blessings from the hand of the Lord, and you'll notice these we're really, especially the Book of Mormon ones, they're talking about, well, and then Saul, they're talking about people who know God. And so this this is one we've got to be really careful for members of the church. We're preparing for Zion. Um, and now behold, I say unto you, that if this people who have received so many blessings from the hand of the Lord should transgress contrary to the light and knowledge which they do have, I say unto you that if this be the case, that if they should fall un into transgression, it would ha be far more tolerable for the Lamanites than for them. For behold, the promises of the Lord are extended to the Lamanites, but they are not unto you if ye transgress. For has not the Lord expressly promised and firmly decreed that if ye re will rebel against him, that ye shall utterly be destroyed from off the face of the earth? So rebellion is wickedness. So, and just to clarify a bit too where my thinking is, going back to the ten virgins, the wise, the wise virgins who actually got in to the marriage feast, I believe, like I said with their foolish virgins, that they served in their callings, paid their tithing, went to the temple, etc., etc. Very similar. Looking at them, they look very similar to them. What is the difference between the two? Do you think those five wise virgins were perfect, made no mistakes, had no sins? Surely not. And the foolish virgins had sins as well. They both had sins. So what was the difference? Okay, let's talk about righteous. Richard G. Scott in the October 2013 General Conference said, The joyful news for anyone who desires to be rid of the consequences of poor choices is that the Lord sees weaknesses differently than he does rebellion. This just makes so much sense to me now. Whereas the Lord warns the unrepented rebellion will bring punishment. When the Lord speaks of weakness, it is always with mercy. Ah, this is what this scripture means then. Isaiah 1, 18 to 20. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing, 
and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So we need to be willing and obedient. So we keep trying and be obedient, but is that, is, we don't have to be perfect. But what we don't need to do is we don't need to refuse and rebel. Let's continue on. Nephi chapter 2, verse 18 to 21. Behold, Laman and Lemuel would not hearken unto my words, and being grieved, this is Nephi speaking, being grieved because of their hardness, of their hearts, I cried unto the Lord for them. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Blessed art thou, Nephi, because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently with lowliness of heart. And again, the ten virgins, I imagine all ten of them were seeking the Lord diligently. And inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper, and ye shall be led to a land of promise. Yea, even the land which I have prepared for you. Yea, a land which is choice above all other lands. And inasmuch as thy brethren shall rebel against thee, again, here's that rebellion, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. So are you getting an idea of what the five foolish virgins might be doing? We'll discuss it a little bit more in detail later. Second Nephi, chapter 4, verse 17 and 19. Nevertheless, notwithstanding the great goodness of the Lord in showing me his great marvelous works, my heart exclaimeth. Who's this? This is Nephi. O wretched man that I am, yea, my heart sorroweth because of my flesh. My soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. Oh, I don't know about you, but I can't. I've been there a couple of times, <laughs> a couple of hundred times. Um, I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do so, do so easily beset me. And when I desire to rejoice, my heart groaneth because of my sins. Then I pick myself up and I say, Nevertheless, I know in whom I have trusted. God does not lie. He says if I, I can make it. So if I just keep trying. Um, this is me speaking. <laughs> I, I, I say to myself over and over again. Uh, okay, I, I didn't do that the way. I believe Heavenly Father wanted it done. Uh, I, I missed that part. I, I could have improved there. I could do better. But I keep trying. The reason I keep trying is because God does not lie. And he says that I can make it. And so now here through these scriptures, he's helping me understand how this works. What's the difference between the, the, the going on my example of the ten virgins both of them serving in callings. And, and let's just take a couple, take two random, and let's go to the males because it's easier for me to understand. Both served as state presidents, mission presidents, and um, come back and serve worthily and, and do that. But one of them continually has debt, doesn't get out of it. The other one is debt, lives in a humble home. The other one lives in a big home. Um, one of them play, you know, likes to watch football on Sunday, but, but still goes and serves and does all this stuff. The other one... Is, is keeping the Sabbath day holy. The, the, the one follows the prophet. When the prophet says to do something, he does it straight away. The other one goes, eh, no, I don't know. But still, you know, can serve and do all these good things and takes, it's that sin of rebellion. You can have these two what would seem righteous people. But if my sins are because now I know better than the Lord, ah, the prophet's only a doctor. That's why he's doing all these things, because he's had that, med you know, that's the reason. He's not a prophet. He's just, he's pushing his own agenda. Wait till he dies and we'll get the next one. He's a judge. That might be different, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever the reasons are, the scriptures don't mean me. It doesn't literally mean that I need to do this. But as with Nephi, the scriptures say, um, whatever the sin may be that you have, um, do this. And you try the best of your ability. And you fail. And you turn to the Lord and you say, 
O oh, wretched man that I am, please forgive me. Please help me. Give me strength and work on it. Um, and he will help you. But it doesn't mean that you'll overcome it in this life. You might have to have that thorn, that weakness throughout your life. Um, Paul talked about the thorns in his side, the difficulties, the, the problems. Um, the difference is do not rebel. If you rebel, you turn over to Satan. If you don't rebel, you can continue on. Let's read a few more scriptures to back this up. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ um, and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. We do the best we can, everything we can do. Be willing to accept, be submissive as a child, whatever the Lord deems to send in our path, whatever sacrifice we need to make, just do not rebel. Just do what the Lord asks you to do. And if you can't do it and you fail, apologize and try again and do the best you can. Just don't rebel. Jacob, chapter 4, verse 7. Nevertheless, the Lord showeth us our weaknesses. And how merciful he doesn't show them all at once. I've been praying and asking for weaknesses um, to be shown. And he shows them to me, that's for sure. Um, but over the years, it's been line upon line, bit here, bit there. He doesn't just dump the whole lot on you. Most embarrassing ones are when you realize that other people have seen them <laughs> for years, but you only just get your eyes open. But at least your eyes are open. You can repent of them. And, and I've been able to overcome uh, many weaknesses, but not all. Anyway, it's not all about me. Nevertheless, the Lord God showeth us our weakness that we may know that it is by his grace and his great condescensions unto the children of men that we have, pad, that we have power to do these things. And think of Nephi, even in his weaknesses, even in his sins, he says they're sins, he knows he's sinning, but even in that, as he strives to overcome that, he has done many great and marvellous things and miracles, as can we all. And if you go through all of the prophets, um, all of the great faithful experiences, these people are not perfect at the beginning. They get more and more perfect as time goes by. And uh, Abraham was a perfect man. And, and But even those who have calling election made sure, they can still make mistakes after that. The Lord knows they will. But they won't do the sin of rebellion. And if they do the sin of rebellion, they become sons of perdition. Ether chapter 12, verse 27. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Why are we here on earth? We will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them, says Abraham. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures are the word of God. They are the iron rod and we can believe them. They are true. They say what they mean. They mean what they say, as Joseph Smith says in Teachings of the Prophets. Um, Joseph Smith is the prophet of this dispensation. He is the one whom we should look towards. We should learn his words, know his teachings. We should understand those who taught, who knew him best and study their words. We understand the scriptures. We listen to the living prophet, follow his guidance. He's warning us. He's, he's been telling us the last days. It's, it's all happening. It's happening fast. And he said that we need to build a strong foundation. Just in this last conference, if we don't have a strong foundation, we're not going to handle the perils that are coming. And how do we build that strong foundation of faith? He's told us, you go to the scriptures, you study, do not be lax learners, spend the time. And why do we study the scriptures? So we can memorize them all? No, so that we can apply the principles that we are taught. The revelation comes from God. He will prompt us to go and do things. We need to understand the Book of Mormon. And we can only do that by studying it, learning it, applying it, pleading with the Lord, asking for revelation. 
as we do this, we will prepare ourselves and become Zion people as we increase in faith and prepare and are willing to do whatever the Lord asks us to do. I know that we can do this. All that hear my voice, and I hope that the Lord brings many to this. I feel that um, the scriptures are calling out to us. So don't hear my voice. You can hear my voice, but hear the voice of the scriptures. You can download this paper on my website, linda.net. You can see the link. You'll see that it's all scriptures and, and uh, conference talks and words of the prophets. Don't worry about all the other stuff I've said, but go and see if you can see what I see. And then look for more. There's more scriptures that talk about all this. Zion shall be redeemed by the pure and righteous, those who serve God righteously. Those who go to Zion, they'll be all invited to come to Zion. Anyone can come to the temple. Sure, everyone's welcome to come to the temple. You must do all that everyone does who goes to the temple. Be baptized, receive the covenants, be worthy. The same with Zion. Zion is the temple. It's where Jesus Christ is going to be anointed King of kings and Lord of lords. Of course the righteous are going to be there. Not any Tom, Dick or Harry is going to come. And they won't come because they won't want to obey the God that lives there. If they are willing to obey him, they can come. It is the righteous. Let's weed out the priest crafts, the philosophies of men, the false teachings in the church. Um, as they're everywhere. And how do we do that? We turn to truth. And where do we find truth? In the scriptures and the words of the prophets. I bear testimony of this. I hope that this helps some people come unto Christ and helps us to prepare for the redemption of Zion and that we may be all be willing to play our part wherever we are in the world, whatever the Lord wants us to do, and that when, the, when we hear him as the prophet of us to do, when we hear the Saviour, we will act and do. And I, this is my prayer and my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.